It's day three of BBC Rail Watch, the programme where we take you behind the scenes of good old British Rail. Uh, good afternoon to you. Welcome to York Live. Bit of a breezy day here today. Today is the day we take a look at many of the things that happen on the railway whilst most of us are tucked up in bed. We'll be taking a close look at the round-the-clock maintenance that helps keep the system running and we'll see a truly non-stop train which delivers and picks up without ever coming to a halt. And we're also in for a bit of shunting today, if you'll pardon the expression. We're going to join Paul Coyer at uh, Doncaster's Belmont Goods Yard, south of York, for what could be described as a moving experience. But first, let's catch up on the news we've created so far this week. Remember some drama in yesterday's Rail Watch when a train arrived here at York, apparently on fire? Well, after being taken out of service, the power car limped its way from here to Neville Hill. That is a maintenance depot, by the way, and not a man. At Leeds, uh, our cameras followed the British Rail engineers as they traced the problem, and we'll see more of that later on. At the close of yesterday, we told you of a Doncaster problem, which halted all trains going through that area. Now, the good news is that the track circuit failure, which meant that the points had to operate manually, was repaired inside 45 minutes. All is now OK. Our driver of the week, John Swaby, who joined us on air here yesterday, is continuing his working week, and we'll catch up with him later. And what of BR's latest named high-speed train, the BBC Railwatch 43108? Well, I have to tell you that not all has gone according to plan in the last 24 hours. We're going to go live now to Rob Curling, who's in regional control here in York. He is in charge of everything, including finding out what the heck has happened to our train. What went wrong with it? Well, Mike, it was running the 823 service this morning from Harrogate to King's Cross, where it arrived 40 minutes late because of a defective battery charger. Now, we can see it here passing through Doncaster at about 10 o'clock this morning. Our own BBC Railwatch car is there at the back of the train. It's been completely shut down. That's not running any power there, so it's just providing the train with a 70-tonne dead weight. So that has slowed the train down quite dramatically, which meant that uh, it arrived late at King's Cross. There was a travelling inspector on board. He wasn't able to fix it because there were no spares available en route. So the uh, HST... Um, uh, controller here has arranged for a replacement part to be taken from Bounds Green to be fitted at King's Cross. That has been fitted, but because of the extra turnaround, our train wasn't able to do its scheduled return run, which was the 12.30 Newcastle to, uh, sorry, 12 to Newcastle. Another train was put on for that. Our train has now just formed the 1400, the 2 o'clock from King's Cross to Edinburgh. It has left six minutes late because of a crewing problem. And as we speak, it's just heading towards Potter's Bar. We'll check up on its schedule at the end of the programme. There's been a lineside fire about three or four miles south of here at York. That has just been extinguished, but that has caused delays from trains. And there was a problem with a uh, postal train uh, overnight, which means if you are in London expecting some posts from uh, Scotland or from the north of England, it's probably waiting on a siding at Peterborough at the moment. Uh, all sorts of problems uh, occurring here at the moment, Mike. Yeah, I mean, a crewing problem and no spares available for the train en route. That's a bit rough, isn't it? It is a bit rough, Mike. Uh, as well as train problems, we've had uh, 50 sheep on the line earlier on this morning, but uh, they've now been cleared. Bah. When most people are asleep and don't want to travel is when the railway, which never sleeps, finds the time to move all the things that there isn't room for on the network. 24-hour-a-day service, British Rail, and the freight trains tend to take over at night time. Paul Coyer is at Belmont Goods Yard now. Paul. Thanks, Mike. This is the Area Freight Centre, and in a series of shifts, there'll be five clerks, there'll be a shift leader and a traffic controller who will keep tabs on up to, say, about 2,000 wagons per day. Now, with me here is Bob Beswick, the Area Traffic Supervisor. 2,000 wagons, Bob, going through this area. How many specifically in your yard here? About 750 in the 24 hours. And we should stress there are actually two yards here, one and up, one yes, and down. Yes, an up, down and a down yard, yes. OK. Now, these clerks on their computer will issue this bit of paper that we have in front of us here. This is basically the description of a specific freight train. It then goes down to the charge man downstairs. What does he do with it? Well, we turn it to shunt list, and the charge man will get it downstairs and look at it. And he'll look at their destination number, which is a five-digit number. And from those numbers, he knows where he wants the traffic. So you're pointing at 89 as the prefix yes. for those five numbers. 289, so where is that, roughly? That's Dover. You see, the railway network split into nine, 89 top series. 01 starts at the north of Scotland, down to mm -hmm. 89 at the south of England. So all these having the prefix 77 will all be going to the same area, then? That's it. Cardiff, in actual fact, those. OK, so he's basically slotted this off. He said that this has to go into 
road number five. That's correct. Just coming up here, TF means? Transfer road. That's the road that takes the wagons from the up yard to the down yard and vice versa. And this is going into five. That's correct. OK, well, of course, the bulk of your work is done at night time. And last night we took our cameras into your yard and we filmed basically the hard work that was going on. Talk me through it. Fair enough, yes. So here we are. We're last night, what, about six o'clock-ish? Yes, that was it, and that's uh, a train actually coming from Scunthorpe. Mm -hmm. It's just drawn up to that stop signal there, where the driver waits for instructions. Right. The train... It's the train... Sorry, I just want to stress it. It is the train that we've seen on the spit of paper. Yes, this is the one, Six Dogs 77. That's the one that came from Scunthorpe. OK. And the train preparer goes up, holding the sheet of paper in his hand. He, first of all, uncouples the engine, giving the driver disposal instructions and then a walk along the train, verifying that the actual wagons on the train correspond with these on the list. And then, when that's all in order, it'll come back to the chargeman, and the next move is the then to shun the train. OK, now that's the tanker on the end. That's the one that was down the bottom of that's our lift, it. just down here. Now, that's been put aside into line because it's not needed so much later. No. There we are, it's this one down here. It doesn't, it? doesn't go away about... He said it's going to five. Yes, well, it's actually for pulling. It doesn't go away about five o'clock tomorrow morning. So he's putting that out of his way. He doesn't want it in the way of the other wagon, you see. What would be in a tanker like that? It could possibly be aviation fuel, or it could be petroleum, diesel, any chemical at all. And they all have the hazard code on the outside so that we can identify them. That's, well, it looks like steel girders. So you've yes. got fuel, you've got girders. What other sort of freight oh, do you Oh, we take transport? everything. We've got dog food, we have sand for making glass. We also have the glass when it's been manufactured. We even take rain for whiskey, then we convey the whiskey when it's been distilled. So. Mm -hmm. No, no, we do everything. Perfectly. How many guys are doing all the hard work out there, incidentally? Well, at present, believe it or not, there's just two who's actually shunting. And one, he will operate the points, mm -hmm. and the other chappy, he'll actually uncouple the wagons and um, signal to the driver where he wants them. OK, now oh. you do transport a lot of coal because I know there are a lot of power stations at your service around here, yeah? That's correct, yes. How many tonnes, roughly, in the course of a week would pass through this area? Oh, I should say... Uh, Three, four hundred thousand tons. Oh, that is an awful lot. Sure. So this is now, if we go back to our list, this series of wagons here, prefixed with the 77. This is the ones that are bound yes. for the south of Wales, right? And they're yes. all going into, if we come across here, TF, which you said the was... Transfer the road. transfer road. So let's see them just going into the transfer, transfer road, road now. There they are, and the shunt is now leaving. It's got one more, hasn't it, or two more wagons yes. to drop off <laughs> after this. That's correct. It's going through. But those in the transfer, they'll mm -hmm. leave those two then on the shunter, and they'll bring those into five road on top of that town. Transfeza there, obviously that's not English, so where no. is this one going? This is obviously from abroad. That's going to Spain, that one. So it'll go down to Dover, then it'll be accepted on the ferry over to Dunkirk, and eventually make its way to Spain. What about with the Channel Tunnel coming up in the future? Is that going to affect your business? Well, it, it will do in a great way. It's already affecting a certain manner because we're getting the steel going for the construction of it. Already? Yes, we do get steel see. going down there. Mm -hmm. And of course, when the tunnel is open, we will be handling extra traffic. So there we are, the end of our train as we just on the docket, and the last wagon is now going into the shunt. So, Bob, that, that goes on all week round, does it? Yes. Except for Saturdays, Sundays, but all the week, yes. OK, well, Bob, thank you very much indeed. There we are, a little bit of an explanation as to what happens. If you join us again later in today's Real Watch, we'll try and keep tabs on those engines, find out where they're standing just now. Mike. Thanks, Paul, with the, uh, the shunters there. No sign of the wheel tappers yet, though. The trains that go bump in the night. The railway is very much, as I said, a 24-hour-a-day operation, and even if passengers don't want to travel in the middle of the night, they do expect their trains to be spick and span first thing in the morning. And that's where the maintenance depots come in. We've heard a lot about maintenance even so far in this programme. The East Coast high-speed train fleets are serviced at four locations. There's Bounds Green, which is near London. There's Heaton in Newcastle. Uh, there's Craig and Tinney, which is near Edinburgh. And the last the largest is good old Neville Hill in Leeds, and Penny Buston is waiting to talk to us live from there now. Penny. Good afternoon, Mike. Well, yes, it's here that the sick, the weary and the worn-out trains and power cars come 24 hours each and every day for refits, rebores and refurbishments. You mentioned earlier the train that we featured yesterday, which had broken down at York. It had a problem with its yaw dampers. Now, they're the things that keep it stable as it goes round corners. It came here yesterday afternoon, and they discovered that five out of the 16 bracket bolts which hold the four yaw dampers in place had sheared off. Here, you can see a faulty one alongside a new one. Quite a difference. 
The intense vibration they undergo means that this can happen if they are under or over tightened. Unnoticed, I'm told that if this could have led to a rather serious problem. Now that was yesterday afternoon. Our man on the night shift, Malcolm McCaig, joined the night shift here last night and kept a very special watch on our train, the Rail Watch Special. mileage during the week. British Rail reckoned to have 92% of their whole fleet scheduled in for service every working day. That's an enormous servicing task. Here at Neville Hill they look after half the East Coast Main Line's intercity fleet every two days. That's 13 HSTs a night on top of their own local traffic. Tonight they've got 18 of those. This is our own rail watch train, and she's been working the East Coast Main Line for 10 years now. So tonight she's in for her two and a quarter million mile service. This is one of the few service stations left in England where somebody washes your windscreen for you while you're waiting for the pump attendant to finish. Once she's been refueled, our train goes forward to be cleaned inside from end to end. You'd be surprised how dirty your fellow passengers can be in the course of one day. And when Mr. and Mrs. Mop have finished, it's time to make way for the Railwatch Dustbusters. Ray, how much did you take? 3,216 litres. Oh, uh, did you take plastic? Sorry, Cassio. Yorkshireman. <laughs> Just moving the trains around is an art in itself. Senior operations officer Tony Wright uses a schematic of the miles of siding to plan his move in this nightly game of railway chess. Now, do I have to lean out the window and put in a token as we go in here, Frank? No, 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 it's, it's all free, is it? As well as cleaning the trains, the night shift at Neville Hill has to deal with all the running faults that have been reported during the day. So tonight we've got the Yorkshire Pullman pulled in with a fire bell that rings when there's no fire, and the master cutler here reported to be passing oil. Nasty, that. We've also got the mysterious case of a buffet car that bounces when it really ought to glide. Quarter past two in the morning and a buffet car has come in with a report of rough riding. They've checked it and found that some of the wheels have been slightly flat, possibly the result of a snatching brake. It's not serious enough to take the car out of service, but the shaking of the bogey has damaged one of the springs. So they've decided they can take the car off the train, jack up the coach and change the spring in about half an hour and get it back into the train, send it out again. Today this train will be programmed so that tonight it finishes at Craig and Tinney where they've got a ground wheel lathe. There they can put the car in on the tracks and re-grind the tyres on the wheels without taking the car out of service at all. And in addition to these urgent, not to say frenetic repairs, the night shift has a challenging schedule of routine maintenance to get through. John Redfern supervises high-speed train maintenance with an air of quiet efficiency. John, what's happening to the trains now? Uh, at this point in time, we are doing A exams, um, examining for loose and missing parts, brake, battery placement, oil levels, lighting, anything that can cause problems over the next one, two, three, four days on that train. 
And how often does that happen to the trains? Uh, usually the minimum time is two days, but we do run up to four days. And how many miles would the trains have covered between examinations? It can vary. We, uh, we know of diagrams that are up to 1,500 miles in a day. So over four days, four or 5,000 miles. It's a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> More than the car would do in the average month, I would think. Once finished in the maintenance sheds, the trains are run back out into the night, almost ready for the morning schedules. At quarter past three in the morning, and at Neville Hill, here's a sight you don't often see in today's modern railway, an engine on a turntable actually being turned. If you were watching Railwatch yesterday, you saw what railway even call a cripple, a train that's failed and had to be taken out of service. It happened at York. Well, that train itself was back in service about 7 o'clock last night. The park car came here to Neville Hill about lunchtime. They looked it over, found what was wrong. It was a fault in the leading bogey. And now it's been fixed. It's ready to go back into service. Now the night shift is almost over. The battle against the clock has once again been won. And BBC Television Rail Watch is ready to get on the road. Malcolm McCaig, the story of man and machine in perfect harmony. In a moment, we're going to uh, look at another side to British Rail's freight operation, moving coal to power stations. And by the way, it is worth remembering that the world's first public railway, the Stockton and Darlington, opened in 1825, was built by coal owners to move coal from the pits to the coastal ports. And coal is still the railway's most important earner. Of course, over the years, the railway has steadily evolved. Just as the look of the trains has changed with the scrapping of steam engines and the introduction of new high-speed trains, so the business the railway does has undergone change. It's not all that long ago that the freight trains looked just like this. Even in 1952, when this film was made, road transport was unable to compete with the railway. The lorries were too small uh, and too slow as well. The road system was tortuous. The railway carried just about everything. That, of course, all changed in the 60s, and as the freight traffic moved to the roads, wholesale closures of branch lines followed, and scenes like these became just a part of memory. Well, nowadays, to compete successfully with the road transport business, the freight sectors of British Rail have had to concentrate on bulk loads, often whole train loads, and so far as possible, long hauls. To do this, some remarkable innovations took place in equipment and operation. One of them quickly became known by the intriguing name, merry-go-round. The big power stations of the Yorkshire coalfield. The baseload generators supplying electricity to the national grid. In the shadow of one of them, Ferry Bridge, lies Nottingley Freight Depot, one of a number of depots where the fleets of locomotives and trucks are based for the sole purpose of moving the coal to feed the monster appetites of the furnaces. And the coal is moved around the clock. 24 hours a day, trains like these are on the move. From colliery to power station, back to the colliery, and again to the power station. 38 hopper wagons, each loaded with 32 tons of coal. Under the bonnet of the class 56 diesel locomotives, the best part of three and a half thousand horsepower. Back in the 1960s, a huge investment program paid for the construction of these new power stations the trains to service them, and, more importantly, for a new method of loading and unloading the coal. Automation was the name of the game. At the power station, the automatic pilot takes over. While the driver looks on, the locomotive eases its huge train load through the discharging shed at the stately pace of half a mile an hour. Automatically, the safety catches come off. Next, the trackside Daleks operate the doors on the underside of the hoppers and 32 tonnes of coal drop neatly onto the conveyor belts below.
Some of the coal is always stockpiled. Between them, the 2,000 megawatt power stations get through 5 million tonnes of coal a year. And especially in wintertime, it's only good housekeeping to keep a little by in case there's a cold snap. With the trucks checked as they leave to make sure that the hopper doors are safely closed, the train is off to load another 1,200 tonnes of coal. These are the coal trains that never stop. They call them merry-go-rounds. And keeping them on the move is a job for the depots like Nottingley. Our function is to provide the traction and rolling stock for the Air Valley coal operations. This involves about 22 locomotives, of which we're required to do about 18 or so service checks around the 24-hour period. A whole range of progressively more extensive services is carried out as the locomotives clock up the miles. But they frequently come in for routine underbody checks, fueling and watering. For extra sand, which can be blown between wheels and rails to improve traction when pulling full loads out of the collieries. The hopper wagons are also maintained here, checked regularly for common problems such as brake lining wear and wheel profile irregularities. With regard to the locomotives, our prime function is to be a service depot and not a maintenance depot. Should we encounter a problem that goes beyond light maintenance and servicing, then we send the locos down to Totem. The main problems we get with hopper wagons is the door gear and the safety catches, which tend to seize up due to the large amounts of coal that is always flowing over them, and the rain that's thrown up by the wheels onto the safety catch bearings. Because the vehicles are now getting pretty old, some are over 20 years old, there is some corrosion taking place around the bodywork, particularly where the body comes in contact with the sole bar. The depot is running nearly 365 days a year. A small shutdown at Christmas, this is due to the uh, colliery holidays, but the demand for coal is at a peak during the winter period when we're required to move in the region of half a million tonnes of coal per week. Rob Curling there in perpetual motion, and I've got a high-speed train and all sorts of things going past me here at the moment. There were the merry-go-round trains. Other train load business carries aggregates, uh, sand and ballast for building. There's oil, there's china clay, other commodities needed in bulk. Earlier on, we saw at Belmont Goods Yard some ferry wagons, the freight vans that run direct to destinations on the continent. Well, this is how they cross the channel, on board the train ferry Nord Par de Calais. It's a joint venture between BR's Rail Freight International and the French railway SNCF. She's a new ship, the latest and largest in a series of ferries that have plied the Dover-Dunkirk route since the 30s. It is uh, 17 years now since the passenger service, the Golden Arrow, last ran, and the service is now purely a freight one. She makes three round trips a day, which will be four when the demand grows, and carrying complete train loads on four tracks on the train deck. Wagons which are carrying hazardous substances, typically chemical feedstops, which may be uh, inflammable or corrosive, can be isolated from the main group of vehicles by special doors. British Rail sees a future for that service even after the Channel Tunnel opens. Well, back on dry land now, let's take a look at another of the new methods of uh, moving freight that have come into general use over the last 20 years or so. This is Stratford Freightliner Depot in East London on any afternoon of the week. Just pulling out is the 1420 Stratford to Wilsdon working, carrying 10 vehicles for Holyhead and 5 for Cardiff. Today the freight is mainly soft drinks, sugar, detergents and household goods, loaded into what to you and me are containers, but to British Rail are a form of intermodal transport. Either way, it means that you put your goods into a standard-sized metal box, take it by road to the terminal, and put it onto a train which then takes it the major part of the journey. 
At the other end, the process is reversed and the container comes off the train to complete its journey by lorry. Stratford has two of these massive cranes to make the switch from rail vehicle to road vehicle in just a few minutes. The operation is slick enough to allow you to deliver your consignment here anything up to half an hour before the train leaves. Our particular business here is dealing and handling with containers. Containers dealing with goods which emanate from the southeast of England, but also acting as a hub centre for containers which move in from Felixstowe and Tilbury, the near ports. Felixstowe dealing mainly with the far east and deep sea business moving into the UK. Tilbury dealing with the Australasia trade. We also have business coming in on a regular basis through from Europe. As a depot activity, we actually handle something in the region of about 500 containers in a 24-hour period. And that's dealt with uh, with services going out, scheduled rail services, approximately 25 in a 24-hour period, going to different destinations throughout the UK, going as far apart as Scotland, down to Bristol, and also direct services through to Ireland, as you saw the train going out and departing earlier on today. It's an effective way of shipping your goods from door to door across long distances. And when the Channel Tunnel opens, everybody expects that more freight, much of it in containers like these, will be moved to and from Europe by rail. John Williams is optimistic about the service he'll then be able to offer his customers. The sort of transit town that we would look certainly from the southeast of England would be moving to Paris within about 12 hours. Now that's the sort of area, the sort of speed of movement that we anticipate will take place. If we look a little bit further afield, then in fact we are hoping to actually get into northern Germany, into northern Italy, certainly within the 24-hour periods, and certainly as we carry on our discussions with the various other railway participants in Europe, hopefully to gather together the activities over there to improve the speed even further into Europe. So we see this as a very, very exciting venture, something we're all looking forward to, something we've been planning for for a long time, and something we're sure will be a great hope and future for the railway industry. Well, here in York Regional Control, it's the job of the locomotive and freight controllers to oversee the freight operation, be it freight liners, coal trains, oil trains, whatever, any freight operation. And also to make sure that the diesel locomotives to haul those trains are kept uh, running. Now, over on the other side of the room, of course, is the HST maintenance controller, whose job it is to make sure that the high-speed passenger train fleet are kept on the move. To do this, uh, he sends them away for repairs and general maintenance to the depot that we've been talking about today, at Neville Hill and down there with more information is Penny Bustin. The day shift here at Neville Hill concentrates on heavy duty planned maintenance. A power car will come in here once every 54 days, a coach once every 35 days. Everything is checked from the brakes to the air conditioning they even get down to shampooing the carpets. They can tackle two complete sets at any one time and the average complete service takes two to three days. Elsewhere in the works, they tackle up to 10 power cars every day which have developed major faults or need new parts. Everything seems to be large scale. Today's work included four leaking engines, a duff radiator unit, power unit problems. All done as fast as possible by 430 staff. Here in the depot stores, they've got over 9,000 items. They could refit just about any train you care to mention. Curtains, first class department, seat covers, a chair for the driver, a window, very necessary after Monday's incident. This is a brake cable, slightly bigger than your average bicycle one. Pistons, 12 of those in each power car, 24 in each high-speed train. A clock for the driver. Windscreen wipers. Every sort of nut and screw you can think of, from this little tiny one here to this enormous brute here. Annually, they spend about 13 million pounds on spares. Every uh, <coughs> need is uh, catered for here. They've even got two-tone horns, G-flat and E-flat for a high-speed train. No railway, of course, would be complete without a green flag and my favourite item of all, the whistle. <coughs> all aboard. Meanwhile, back downstairs in the back fitting room where all the heavy work takes place, Colin, tell me, is this an average sort of day for your men? Yes, yeah, about average. We, we would normally expect ten power cars, but today we've got eight because two are away under major repairs in the main works. Uh, if we have any more than ten, 
it means that somebody else is suffering or it means that we may be cancelling the train. We saw what looked like a rather complicated exercise earlier with some bogeys. Does that take place regularly? Well, it's a, it's a routine practice for us. Uh, we, we change the bogeys every two and a half years. We'd expect that to have done somewhere in the region of 450,000 mile. And we would expect to change them within 24 hours. The bogeys arrive and the old ones are ready for going away. And where would they have come from? Uh, either Derby Works or Crew, that's B-R-E-L. The engine, I mean, was just amazing. I've never seen anything that big. Well, the engine's our, our biggest component. It's also our most costly, at 80, approximately £80,000 per engine. We would be expected to do 65 engine changes this year, and we've done up to about 55 up to now. And how often does an engine have to be changed? Every two years, which, once again, is, is about every 400,000 miles, if they last that long. It needs to be changed because the engine itself is life expired. So to prevent extensive damage if, if it does disintegrate, we would sooner take them out before rather than later. Changing brakes, now I understood what that was all about. How often does that happen? Uh, roughly about once a month, we, we will be changing brake pads. Uh, remembering that the brake pads have got to stop a brake from 125 miles an hour to zero, and that takes a lot of doing. And so obviously there's a lot of wear and tear. A lot of wear and tear, a lot of heat. And the heat dissipation causes the problems on the discs because with the expansion and contraction, eventually the, the discs crack. Do your men specialise in any one area? No, fitters do fitting work, electricians do electricians' work, although we do have a bit of craft interchangeability at the moment. But the job does get repetitive because they're working on the same class of vehicle all the time. What's your priority? What, what's the thing that's at the back of your mind every day? Our priority is to get 13 trains out every morning for the public. And it, that means we've got to get power cars available to get those 13 trains out. And do you succeed most times? Uh, every time. The train is thought to need a new coat of paint about once every two years. It takes them about two days to rub down the entire surface, and then with such an enormous area to cover, you'd expect that they'd spray it. But no, you'd be wrong. They found that the old-fashioned hand-painting method is much, much better. It takes about six days to put two coats of paint on a power car like this. With us now is Brian Ward, who is Eastern Region's Chief Press Officer. Brian, we've seen today and overnight how the power cars are maintained. What we need to know now is why so many of them over the past couple of days have needed to be maintained. Well, obviously we've got to maintain our trains to keep them in service. It's true that viewers have seen some four or five power cars fail during the past two days, but let's put those failures into perspective. We've run over 200 high-speed trains on the East Coast Main Line during the last two days. On Monday, our problems were largely caused by the severe weather in Scotland. Yesterday, 50% of all our trains were in their destinations bang on time. 80% were within 10 minutes of time. It's true that some were delayed, but that was largely due to uh, a continuance of the severe weather and the conditions they caused. So you're saying it was just bad luck that our cameras happened to be around when there were so many breakdowns? I think we accept that there will be uh, failures. Um, our equipment is now over 10 years old. The high-speed trains are doing over 1,100 miles a day. Um, they've done, many of them have done over two and a half million miles now. But we are well aware that um, there is a limit to the demands we can place on the high speed trains. That's why we're investing £306 million on East Coast Mainline electrification and new trains for the route. The incident we saw yesterday with the, the train with its yaw dampers damaged, could that have been dangerous? Was that potentially lethal? I'm told by our engineers that it wouldn't have been lethal and it certainly wouldn't have been dangerous. Nevertheless, it's something we don't like to see. And as you know, most of the power cars that have gone out of service in the past two days have been speedily returned to traffic. But what about our own rail watch train? Now, that's a bit of an embarrassment for you. It is an embarrassment to us and I can promise you we shall be doing everything we can to get that train back into service and running highly successfully tomorrow. There you are, that's the view from Neville Hill this afternoon. Now back to the studio. 
Thank you. It's me here in control. In fact, it's interestingly enough, we've just heard that our rail watch train has stopped, made an, a special stop at Stevenage to pick up a travelling fitter because of the problems it's been having, having this morning, which has made it even further behind schedule. It left King's Cross six minutes late. Um, we actually followed one of these uh, travelling inspectors, uh, Roger Senior. He's one of the East Coast Main Line's riding inspectors, as they call them. And uh, we followed him as he began another day of troubleshooting. Trains, like other mechanical objects, develop problems occasionally, but British Rail can't afford to simply drop those affected from the schedules. 0700 at Doncaster Station. A typical start for a technical riding inspector boarding a train to check on a driver reported problem. The inspector's role is to locate and remedy faults not serious enough to force replacement rolling stock. The day begins with a call to York Control to assess work priorities as things can change fast on this East Coast main line. The plan was to travel to Newcastle on a train with braking problems and then return to Doncaster, but the schedule had changed twice by 7.30. Well, it appears things have changed again. We're going to Newcastle as planned, but from Newcastle we're going to have to ring in again because there's some more trains that's now in bother. So we could be either going south or even going farther north up until we actually get to Newcastle and get an update. What kind of problems are there? We've got something that's in bother with low power. It means that the train can't get to line speed at its the correct, you know, it's fast enough, which affects its timing, which can affect other trains. And that's, that's the problem we seem to have today with one or two trains running around. Is it like a long day? It could be a long day today, yeah. 43057 pulled into Doncaster slightly late and Roger boarded immediately to start fault finding. The noise of 24 litres of turbocharged diesel at 125 miles an hour doesn't suggest an ideal working environment, which is why ear defenders are essential. Faults are as often as not located in the rear power car, and the inspector can find himself walking past rows of breakfasting businessmen to the back of the train. Here he can monitor all the engine readouts without distracting the driver, even if the look of travelling backwards at this speed is mildly unsettling. What I do is I ride these HSTs up and down, which wherever they've got faults, we can find out more by riding them where the faults lie than we can at a depot. You, you can see what's happening. You, you can, you know, at certain speeds you should be you should be doing the certain amps uh, and things like that. So that's the idea of the job is to find out where the faults lie, find out what's wrong with it, try and repair it if you can, and if not, you then report to your control who have the overall responsibility of planning the maintenance side tell them the faults and they can then plan accordingly whether it needs rectification straight away or it can run until it gets to a depot at night. The intermittent braking fault hadn't displayed itself for almost 200 miles. That was the fault we're experiencing now. It's made a brake application but not by the means of the driver. So it's a case now of finding out where the problem lies but as you can see the brake pipe has returned to normal which makes my job slightly harder because the system is now working normal again. So Roger spent most of the journey with one eye on the brake pressure dial whilst he checked each of the brake relays. Not an easy job at 125 miles an hour. I can finish up anywhere on, anywhere on the East Coast Main Line by orders of York Control who in touch with the radio pager which means they can get in touch with me straight away and Depending on the message of the pager, either get off the train or stop onto another destination, which means there's another train somewhere in trouble, which they want me to attend to straight away. We're now approaching Newcastle, and as yet we haven't actually detected the fault, although we've had it, we haven't quite detected it. Hopefully, on the return journey, we might be more successful. We'll wait and see. Well, the sequel to that story is that Roger Senior stayed with the train all the way to King's Cross that day, still didn't track down that elusive intermittent brake fault. However, the next day he tried again and struck lucky. He found an electrical fault and was able to fix it without the train having to come out of service. That is a typical task, typical day for a technical riding inspector. Right, it's almost three o'clock, almost time for the end of the show, but let's quickly go back to Belmont Goods Yard and Paul Coyer. Paul. 
Thanks, Mike. Well, as I said earlier, the bulk of the work is done here at night time, but during the day we have to clear up maybe one or two of the problems from yesterday. For instance, today we had a train which arrived at Broadworth Colliery from Thorpemarsh, uh, sorry, at the Thorpemarsh power station, I beg your pardon, from Broadworth Colliery. It arrived minus 18 tonnes of coal, so we've had to find it. We phoned up to the signal centre. It's not on the main line. We've tracked it down now. It's apparently at the branch line at Broadworth, and we're on our way to pick up that 18 tonnes of coal. So if you live in the area, no sneaking down there with your wheelbarrows. Uh, Freightliner train came in here it had to be re-engined that's uh, real speak for a new engine being put on and the new engine wasn't powerful enough to take them all away from here so we've had to arrange for the extra wagons to be taken on some bricks in a the wagon they fell off one shunt too many perhaps we've had to call the owner of the bricks and he's come up here to assess the damage and another wagon the door opened en route and uh, unfortunately that was due to vandalism what were they after well apparently it was filled with fertilizer so if you're in the Immingham area which is where it came from we'll be checking your roses in a couple of uh, months' time, finding out who's got the fertilizer. Dave Greensmith, the shift leader over here, is at the Total Operations Processing System, or TOPS as we call it, and with this you can tell me where any wagon is in the country, can't you? That's right, Paul, yes I can. It's can you call up the wagon that we had earlier that Bob was telling us about, the one that's en route to Spain? Where, like, where is it just now? From yeah. memory, it was on its way down to Dover, To Dover, it? yes, yep. going to Dover, and then it would go over on the ferry to, on its way to Spain. So there's its number. As we can so see, logged on. the number, the commodity, and its destination, 89691, which is Dover. That's right. For Transpeza, and it is in Dover Yard now, and it's in hold. Yeah. They're holding it there, waiting clearance, and then it'll go over on the boat, possibly tonight. Right, let's go live outside and get a driver's eye view of what's happening out in the marshalling yard at the moment. In fact, just over my shoulder, you can probably see there it is there. And our driver's eye view. The driver today has been with British Rail for 43 years. It's Harry Blackburn. 30 years of his career has been spent driving. In fact, he's one of the last of the regular steam train drivers, and he's driven the Deltics as well. Now, that wagon that he's pulling there has a brake problem. Can you call up the number of that on your top system here and find out what it's carrying? And it's coming up on our computer terminal now. There we are. We're into the system. There's the number of the wagon you can see outside. That's it. It's Long. been taken away for some brakes to be fixed. Yeah. It's a wagon loaded with sections, actually. It's uh, quite topical. It's for the uh, Channel Tunnel Link. And again, that's on its way down to Dover. Okay, that wagon's uh, about 10 years old, incidentally, isn't it? So what, about yeah. 25 grand to buy that 10 years ago? 25,000 to buy it 10 years ago. 37,000 to replace it now. That's a lot of money. And uh, I believe that about half of the wagons that pass through here are privately owned. Yeah, about 50%. It's an expensive yeah. business. Yeah. Thank you very much okay. indeed. So there we are, a day in the life of a marshalling yard. Now to your Control and Rob. Thanks very much, Paul. The latest on our own Railwatch train is that it's now 10 minutes behind time. It's just passing, uh, just passed through Peterborough Station. Now, of course, we've been following our, our train throughout the week. Uh, by the time it got to King's Cross this morning, it had done something like 1,982 miles this week, so it's halfway on its way to America by now. Uh, as far as the driver's concerned, he started off driving the train, of course, uh, on Monday. He was driving the Railwatch train. Today, he's only doing a parcels train from King's Cross up as far as Leeds, and then another driver took it on to Newcastle. John Swaby then returned to London as a passenger. By the time he gets to bed this evening, he'll have done a total of 1,120 miles. Mike, a fairly interesting story that came in on the log of problems that they've had overnight. Yeah. One driver yesterday was had up for speeding. This is driving a train, not a car. He was caught by a British Rail official who presumably was uh, hiding behind a signal post or something with their own uh, radar speed trap, a kind of problem I suspect you might have come across, Mike. Certainly not, but you know, the, 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 the cynics in life would say he should be given a medal, Rob, for speeding on British Rail. Yes, maybe he should, yes, making up some time. Maybe we should get our rail watch driver to do that now. Well, are we, I mean, are we maybe painting two black a picture this afternoon is, is you know we're showing all these things that are going wrong of course a lot most of it goes right doesn't it a lot of it goes right Mike you must remember of course that there's a heck of a lot of stock here and it's being used absolutely to capacity as one of our controllers here said uh, these HSTs are pretty well being flogged they don't get much of a rest and so these kind of technical problems are fairly common well, we saw that from, from Penny's report in Leeds, that they do have to go through a lot of maintenance. But what do you suspect is the major problem? I mean, if they bought some more trains and got some newer stock out there, wouldn't it solve it? 
I think uh, that's partly the problem. I think as far as the uh, diesel locomotive fleet is, that's pretty, uh, pretty old. They haul still some of the passenger trains and uh, most of the, uh, the freight trains. I think as far as these HSTs are concerned, uh, one problem, I mean, thank goodness, there's a power car at each end. What will happen when they bring in these new Class 91 locomotives that have yeah. only got a power car at one end? Uh, how are they going to move the trains then? And of course, the electrification service that's coming up shortly, they're just doing this. In fact, this work is going on behind me here. You can see out the window. They're actually uh, preparing the East Coast Main Line for total electrification. And then there'll be a whole load of new engines coming on because, of course, the HSTs haven't got the, the cantilever pantograph on top of them to pick up the power. But they'll be, be bringing new locomotives to do that and they'll be running on this very line all the way up the East Coast. So things aren't that bad and things are improving on British Rail. There's a lot of investment going into this sort of thing here. We'll be back with you at the same time tomorrow. I'm nipping off to Leeds right now. I'm going to join Penny Buston and Paul Coyer down there. Between us we'll bring you the behind the scenes story of how a big city station is run, a complex inv operation involving a mix of services. There's intercity, cross-country, provincial, local commuter services. And Rob Curling will be in uh, Leeds uh, where they've had their fair share of problems this morning. Haven't they, Rob? They have. I won't actually, Mike. I'll be here in York Control tomorrow. You'll be in Leeds. But uh, they have had problems this morning. There were 60 uh, arrivals uh, in one hour at Leeds, but two locomotives then break, broke down, which meant they had to make 12 platform changes at that point. So they've had a pretty hectic morning. Yes, you're right. Okay, Rob, tomorrow's another day. We'll report live from Leeds in Railwatch tomorrow at 2.15. Please do join us until then. Good afternoon. <laughs> Super game. What an absolutely super game. It means